Up next, a young man falls ill, and no one knows why. Maybe he had been exposed to something through his work. Despite the best of medical intensive care, he dies. If it's accidental, is it suicide, is it homicide? But investigators know there must be a clue somewhere. The more we looked into it, the more bizarre it got. The research triangle in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina, home to many high-tech research and development companies. 30-year-old Eric Miller worked there looking for a cure for pediatric AIDS. His wife, Ann, was also a scientist working for a large pharmaceutical company. Eric and Ann Miller were living the American dream. They had good jobs, they had a beautiful baby, they lived in a nice house, they attended church. Despite a satisfying professional life, Eric developed health problems that some suspected might have been related to his job. He exhibited a lot of flu-like symptoms, vomiting, fevers, headaches, and people generally thought that he had a virus or that he had a bacterial infection that they just couldn't isolate. One night, while bowling with his friends, his symptoms were so severe he had to be hospitalized. Ann Miller said he was pale and white and he was holding a trash can and said he had eaten a hot dog at the bowling alley and felt like he had gotten food poisoning. Eric was put into intensive care, but when his condition improved, he was released. Several days later, he was hospitalized again. This time, doctors found a huge amount of arsenic in his system, well over the lethal level. The urine test from the second hospital was, um, was really high. It was sky high. It's tasteless, it's odorless, it's water soluble, can easily be mixed in with food or drink. Arsenic is a poison used in pesticides, herbicides, and insecticides. And they asked him if he knew of anybody that would have any reason to, to harm him or hurt him in any way, and he indicated that he did not. Within hours, Eric Miller was dead. It's a very, very painful way to die. Arsenic basically eats away at your body from the inside out. It causes you to have violent, violent uh, nausea, convulsions. Your system sh starts shutting down organ by organ. But where did the arsenic come from? A check of Eric's workplace showed he had no exposure to arsenic there. We went to the lab and we looked at every chemical in the lab and checked for arsenic. We did not find anything that was arsenic or arsenic derivative. They also checked Eric's home. We seized every bottle of water, every carton of milk, everything that was there. Again, they found nothing. So investigators focused on that night in the bowling alley when Eric first exhibited the extreme symptoms. A witness said Eric had a beer shortly before feeling ill. Eric had commented during the time that the beer tasted bitter to him, that there was a, a strange taste to the beer. And he went to the bathroom a number of times, and he became so ill that, in fact, he brought the trash can from the bathroom over to the lane where they were bowling. Witnesses said Eric's friend, Daryl Willard, had given Eric the beer. Investigators tried to speak to Daryl about that, but he refused. Daryl said, I can't talk to you anymore. I've got to talk to my lawyer. Then, six weeks after Eric's death, Daryl's wife found him on the floor of the garage in a pool of blood, a gun in his hand. My husband just killed himself. He just what? He killed himself. OK, and he's inside the home? He's in the garage. He's in the garage? Yes. There was a suicide note tacked to the wall of the garage. I am sorry to leave you, my wife, my beautiful daughter, like this. I have been accused of an action for which I am not responsible. I have taken no one's life, save my own. I love you all. And I think Daryl Willard had to know something about the death of Eric Miller. In police work, that's what we call a clue. 
police in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina had two suspicious deaths. Eric Miller's death was caused by a massive dose of arsenic. Six weeks later, Eric's friend, Daryl Willard, committed suicide. The two had been together at the bowling alley on the night Eric Miller fell ill. Daryl, completely out of character for him, according to everybody we talked to, buys a pitcher of beer while they're waiting for a lane to free up. That when Eric took his first swallow beer, you know, it doesn't taste quite right. And shortly before Daryl Willard committed suicide, he had confessed to his wife that he had been having an affair with Ann Miller, Eric's wife. We don't know whether or not he told his wife anything else about his potential involvement with Arsenic or Eric Miller at the bowling alley. Investigators searched Willard's work computer and phone records. They also searched Ann Miller's. They found ample evidence of the affair. From the middle of October until Eric's death, she's got like 500 cell phone calls to Daryl Willard's desk, to his house, or to his cell phone. She's called him over 500 times. Anne also sent Daryl emails. I want to make you feel so many things. I want to show you new things. I want to touch places in you that you didn't know existed. You better leave the women alone. You have me. Ann Miller and Daryl Willard both worked together at the same pharmaceutical company. Investigators learned they spent a weekend together at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Chicago shortly before Eric's death. They registered as Mr. and Mrs. Daryl Willard. But hotel employees later confirmed that the woman was Ann Miller. Ann and Daryl ordered a lot of room service. Just three days later, when Eric Miller was in the hospital, investigators learned that his wife, Ann, contacted another man with whom she was having an affair, a fellow scientist living in California. Ann says, my husband is gravely ill, but if I could buy you a beach house and spend the night with you, I would do it in a heartbeat. She also said in that email communication that he could call the house and they could speak by phone because her in-laws wouldn't know any better and they wouldn't suspect anything. No one knows if Daryl Willard knew Ann Miller was involved with other men, but it was clear to investigators that Daryl Willard and Ann Miller both had a motive to kill Eric. At the pharmaceutical company where both Ann Miller and Daryl Willard were employed, police found arsenic. They were using cacodylic acid to clean their glassware. And at first glance, you might not know what cacodylic acid, but it is actually, it actually is arsenic. This was the same type of arsenic found in Eric Miller's body, which meant the poison that killed him probably came from the lab where his wife and her lover worked. There were some controls with regard to arsenic and access to arsenic in, in the lab. Um, those controls were, were not particularly tight. But a search of both the Willard and Miller homes turned up nothing. We had it all tested for arsenic. It all came up negative. Although police considered Ann Miller a suspect, Eric's parents did not. Eric's parents were very adamant that Ann was not involved. Um, they had accepted Ann into their family. She was their daughter-in-law, and they had a good relationship with Ann. But strangely, against the wishes of Eric's family, Ann insisted that Eric's body be cremated. Everyone that follows any type of forensic investigation knows that the easiest way to get rid of evidence is by cremating somebody. Eventually, Ann Miller quit her job, sold her home, and moved three hours away to Wilmington, North Carolina, where she refused to cooperate further with investigators. No comment. But even though Eric's body was cremated, the medical examiner kept samples from his autopsy. Investigators hoped something in these samples would prove a homicide. 
In the search for Eric Miller's killer, medical detectives hope to find some clues in tissues saved from his autopsy. Scientists knew Eric's death was caused by arsenic poisoning, but they needed to find out when and by whom. Arsenic stays in your hair. Obviously, your hair grows, and so the poisonings that occurred earlier are going to be on the end of your hair, and the poisonings that are more recent are going to be towards the scalp. Eric Miller's hair was kept in storage after his autopsy. From the length of Eric's hair, investigators would have a record of the last six months of his life. In a process called neutron activation, the hair samples were cut into five millimeter sections. Each section represented about two weeks in Eric Miller's life. You can't take hair and say this person was poisoned on January 12th, but you can take hair and say this person was poisoned during this two week period. Each clipping was put into its own vial, placed in a nuclear reactor, and bombarded with radiation. The resulting graph showed Eric ingested a huge dose of arsenic in the two weeks before his death. In that two-week period, Eric complained of severe symptoms on three separate occasions. Once was at the bowling alley when Eric was with Daryl Willard. It's my opinion, very strong opinion, that Daryl Willard had actually given Eric a lethal dose of arsenic in that cup of beer that he served to him. Interestingly, witnesses said Daryl knocked over Eric's beer before he could finish it. I think that beer got spilled because Daryl Willard did not want Eric Miller to die. I think Daryl Willard was a good man, and I think that he got caught up in Ann Miller's web, if you will, and he realized what was happening and, and did not want to go through with that. Ann told investigators she was at home with her daughter on the night Eric went bowling. But a check of Ann's cell phone record showed something very different. At about 7.20, Ann Miller's cell phone was used in close proximity to the bowling alley based on where the tower was hit. In fact, cell phone records showed Ann actually made a call to her home to check her voicemail. The call bounced off a cell phone tower near the bowling alley. So it put a little bit of a hole in Ann Miller being at home. A couple of days later, Eric had dinner with his wife alone at home and again. He got sick. Ann prepares a meal and serves it there. And that night, about two, three hours later, Eric has a recurrence of the same symptoms that he had the night of the bowling alley. Again, Eric was rushed to the hospital, but this time he was dead within 16 hours. We had put it enough together to say, in all reasonable probability, Ann Miller and Daryl Willard conspired to kill Eric. But the other shocking piece of information that came from the analysis of Eric's hair was that the poisonings had been going on for months. The testing showed that Eric Miller had been poisoned multiple times. And they were able to isolate, I believe, three times for certain, but multiple times over the six-month period previous to his death. But if she wanted him dead, why take so long to do it? There were a lot of theories about this. One was that she was torturing him. The most obvious one that I think investigators kind of settled on was that she wanted to create a pattern of him appearing to be sick. So when he finally did die, nobody would suspect poisoning. But investigators had a problem. They knew what caused Eric's death, and they knew when he was poisoned. But proving who was responsible would be another matter. Investigators believe that Ann Miller had poisoned her husband and was responsible for his death. It was the motive they had a hard time figuring out. 
Since Eric didn't have a big life insurance policy, money was not considered a motive. The only life insurance was in the amount of $100,000. Investigators believe Ann's lover, Daryl Willard, may have been involved in putting arsenic in Eric's beer at the bowling alley. But they're convinced it was at Ann's direction. I think Ann Miller was driving the train. Daryl Willard was a passenger. He was not making these decisions. And he was a victim, just like Eric Miller. They also believe that Ann put arsenic in Eric's food, the last meal he consumed before his death. The massive dose of arsenic was given to Eric the night before he finally went to the hospital for the last time. Investigators also found evidence that Eric Miller had come very close to finding out about Ann's affair with Daryl Willard. It happened when Ann didn't come home from work on time. Eric got upset and started driving around trying to find Ann because they didn't know where Ann was. At 9 o'clock, she then calls her mom, and she finds out everyone's looking for her. And I think, in my opinion, what triggered Ann to do something, it was getting close for Ann Miller. She almost got caught by Eric on November 29th of committing adultery or having an affair, and it triggered the fatal dose of November 30th. I think she didn't want to be a divorced woman. She didn't want that stigma. She didn't want to deal with child support, child visitation, custody. As a widow, she got sympathy. And she didn't have to deal with all of the messy stuff that comes along with divorce. Before his death, Daryl Willard made an offhand comment to investigators that made it appear he knew he'd been set up. I said, Daryl, I think you're being used. I think a woman's using you. And I think, you know, it'd be in your best interest to cooperate with us. And the only thing he said was, yeah, and she's doing a mighty good job of it. The very next day, Willard committed suicide. I mean, you had the scientific evidence, and that was hard and fast. But you needed a witness. You needed somebody to say, Ann Miller did this. Daryl Willard, he was the only witness that could testify against Ann Miller and could give them the information that they needed to arrest her. So prosecutors asked the North Carolina Supreme Court to force Daryl Willard's lawyer to reveal what Daryl told him about Ann Miller's involvement. Client confidentiality is, is one of the um, Im most important parts of our, our system. The judge studied the case and ruled that a small portion of what Daryl Willard told his lawyer was admissible in court. In other words, the attorney can talk about what his client told him if it involves a third party who might have committed an egregious crime like murder. Daryl Willard told his lawyer about a conversation he had with Ann Miller in a parking lot just after Eric's death. The attorney stated that his client, Daryl Willard, told him that Ann Miller went to the hospital on that first hospital stay, took a syringe, and injected something into Eric Miller's IV, which presumably was arsenic. He then stated that he asked Mrs. Miller why she had done this, and she replied, I don't know. Killers all share one common bond, and that is they are arrogant. They are in denial that they're doing anything wrong. This person's in their way, they're messing up their life, and they want him out of the way. And that's it. It's, it's very simple. With a search warrant, investigators found a love note Anne had written to Eric around the time the poisoning started. Some believe this was the beginning of the cover-up. Others think it's a look into Anne's soul. There once was a girl who knew little of sharing, little of caring. She knew how to love, but not unconditionally. She knew little of giving and nothing of sacrifice. She lived in her own world, and then you entered my world and changed everything I knew. There is nothing I wouldn't do for you. Ann Miller's a psychopath. She suffers from the malignant narcissism that you know, 
To her, the whole world revolves around what she wants, what she needs. Rather than risk a jury trial, Ann Miller agreed to plead guilty to second-degree murder and received a minimum sentence of 25 years in prison. It's one of those cases where you are left with as many questions as, as answers. And so that, that can be very difficult, not only for the prosecutor, but certainly for the family members, is, is you don't get the why. Even though Ann Miller tried to eliminate the evidence through cremation, it only took a single strand of Eric's hair to chart months of deception and the final act of murder. And to think that a record of this poisoning was just kept in one single strand of hair um, is pretty unbelievable, pretty amazing. People can think they can get away with murder, but the technology is going to bite people. This is my first homicidal arsenic poisoning, and I hope it's my last. It, it's just you have to look for truth and justice. You never give up the fight.